Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of College and Career Pathways, where every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 2 p.m. we provide you with information on various colleges and universities, financial aid resources, technical schools, training programs, employment opportunities, career exploration, skilled trade professions, and career readiness skills, all designed to help you make the best career decisions possible. I'm Tony Curitan, your host, and today we are talking about the FAFSA application. The deadline is here for you to apply for federal student, free federal student financial aid. However, even though the deadline is here, you still can fill the application out and get your application in and get awarded funding. It is, on, it is awarded on a first come first serve basis, so you still have time. So let me open up my screen so that I can share this information and we get you started on getting your uh, federal free, your free federal student applica aid application in. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of College and Career Pathways, where every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m., we provide you with information on various colleges and universities, financial aid resources, technical schools, training programs, skilled trade professions, employment opportunities, career exploration, and career readiness skills, all designed to help you make the best career decisions possible. I'm Tony Curitan, your host, and today we're going to be talking about filling out the FAFSA application. Today is the deadline for your FAFSA application. So I want to help you get your application filled out and in so that you can receive all of the uh, scholarships and grants and any type of award money that's available to you to assist you in your college tuition. So I'm going to open up my screen and begin to share this information so that you can get your FAFSA application in. Okay, everyone, welcome. Welcome to another episode of College and Career Pathways, where every Monday and Wednesday and Friday at 2 p.m. we provide you various information on colleges and universities, financial aid resources, skilled trade professions, technical schools, employment opportunities, skilled trade professions, career exploration and career readiness skills, all designed to help you make the best career decisions possible. I'm Tony Curitan, your host, and today we will be talking about filling out the FAFSA application. So I'm going to open up my screen so we can start sharing all this wonderful information and help you get started with this. So I want to remind everyone that uh, the deadline for filling out your FAFSA is here. So you really do need to get that application filled out and turned in. Now, just because the deadline is here does not mean you are no longer able to fill the application out and um, turn it in because you can. Because the FAFSA, the award amount and monies are based on a first come first serve basis. So of course, the sooner you get your application in, the better your chances are of receiving the full amount of your award. Uh, the award for this year is $6,300. Um, if you send your application in after the deadline, which is today, um, it doesn't mean you won't get awarded. It just means that you may not, based upon how many other people have filled out the application, you may not get the full amount of the award. But nevertheless, don't even concern yourself with that. Just let's get it filled out. Let's get it filled out and submit it. I know you might say, well, you know what, Ms. Tony, I don't know that I want to go to school or maybe I want to go to a skill trade program. And so I don't really need to fill it out. Yes, you do. 
And the reason why you do is because the uh, FAFSA is not just for community college and universities. It is also for uh, training programs and technical schools, cosmetology schools, um, heating and cooling, HVAC schools. There are many trade schools, technical programs that now accept uh, the FAFSA. So yes, you do need to fill it out. And then even if you're one of those people that will say, well, Ms. Tony, I still haven't decided on, on what I wanna do exactly. Fill the application out anyway, because it's better that you fill it out and have your award of money waiting for you and then you decide, you know what, um, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take a year off, or I'm I'm gonna go work, rather than you don't fill it out and then you make the decision. You know what? I, I think I do want to take a class or two, and it's not there and available for you. So, fill it out, fill it out, fill it out, fill it out. So we're gonna get started, and so. The free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA, which is what is commonly known as, is an online application completed by current and prospective college students to determine their eligibility for student financial aid from the federal government, from the local and state scholarship, as well as grant and institutional scholarships and grants. So the reason why you need to get this filled out is because it's not just only for your federal Pell Grant monies that you could be awarded, but it is also for any scholarship grant monies that you would be eligible for. Every resource, every funding resource pulls their information from that FAFSA application. That's why it's important you fill it out. You can apply for the Pell Grant or the FAFSA, but then when you apply to the particular school or program that you wanna attend, they may have a private scholarship or grant that they offer only to their students. And then they take the information from your FAFSA application and determine whether or not you're eligible for that as well. So every funding source besides the Pell Grant, the FAFSA, takes its information from the FAFSA application. That's why it's important that you fill it out so that you make yourself available to all funding resources that could possibly give you money so that it will help you with your uh, tuition and your books and whatever expenses you incur in your pursuit of getting your college or your certificate. We're gonna take a look at a quick video right here that is going to give us an overview on the FAFSA. Tony, is there sound on the no, video? I was just going to say the same thing. Sorry. That's okay. You guys can't hear it? No, we haven't heard anything. Are you serious? <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, let's just back that up. Thank you. All right, all right, let's go in here, share. And of course, we put that. 
Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA. Yeah, it's good. Most yeah, we can hear it now. Complete online. And the best part, it's 100% free. And it provides you with access to grants, loans, and work-study funds from the federal government. And many colleges and states use FAFSA information to provide their own college or state financial aid. Before you fill out the FAFSA, it's a good idea to create your FSA ID, a username and password that lets you electronically sign your FAFSA and gives you access to various websites related to federal student aid. And here's an important tip. If your parent is providing information on your FAFSA, he or she will need his or her own FSA ID. Visit studentaid.gov forward slash FSA ID for more information. Your FAFSA can be completed online at fafsa.gov and help is provided throughout the online application process. You will need to fill out the FAFSA each year you are in school because your financial situation may change. Plus, you may be able to automatically transfer your tax data from the IRS, making the application even quicker to fill out. Each state and college or career school sets its own deadline for the FAFSA, so it's best to get it done early. Since some of the funds are available on a first-come, first-served basis, you don't want to miss out. Now that you know about the FAFSA, you might be asking, well, how much money will I get? Your college or career school will do the math, and there's a simple formula that they use. First, the college takes your cost of attendance, which is the total amount it will cost you to go to that school. Your cost of attendance will vary from school to school. Then, the college subtracts your expected family contribution, or EFC, your EFC is based on information provided in your FAFSA and will not change based on the school you attend. However, the EFC is not necessarily the amount of money you will have to pay. Basically, your cost of attendance minus your EFC equals your financial need. Your college uses your financial need and other information to determine how much financial aid you can receive. See? Pretty simple. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. Okay, so that is a basic overview of what the FAFSA is all about. It is all about you trying to obtain funding to assist you in payment for your tuition, your books, and any of your college expenses. Now, there are six types of federal student aid that you can receive. You can receive the Pell Grant, you can receive college work study. You can receive the Michigan Competitive Scholarship of a TIP program or grant. You can receive school specific scholarships and you can receive subsidized and ups and unsubsidized loans. So filling out the FAFSA application is for receiving the Pell Grant. However, it is, as I say, every other financial resource that could be available to you pulls the information from the FAFSA application to determine whether you're eligible for any of those programs. So for the Michigan Competitive Scholarship or the TIP program, they pull their information from the FAFSA application to determine if you'll receive money from TIP. Um, school specific scholarships, Every college, every university has their own scholarships that they offer specifically to their students. Some of them are based on academic merit, which means you'll have to uh, have a certain grade point average. You'll have to write essays. And then some of them are financially based scholarships, meaning just like with the FAFSA application, you will they'll pull the information from the FAFSA application, looking at your finances and determine whether or not you're eligible for those grants. And then they have department specific scholarships where, for example, if you are at Macomb Community College and you wanna study culinary arts, they have grants specifically for the culinary art program. And so all students that are going into that field, they can apply for those scholarship monies and receive assistance if they're awarded to assist them in their, in their tuition while they're in the culinary program. And then you have your loans. Loans are listed last on this um, slide because loans should be considered last when you're considering money 
for going to school. You do not want to go into debt. You should try to avoid that as much as you possibly can. But in the advent, you do go down that route. You want to go subsidized loan before unsubsidized loan. The difference being subsidized is the government loan that you receive at a lower interest rate and more flexible payment or repayment options. Unsubsidized loans are usually loans that you obtain from your local banks and credit unions. Uh, their interest rate is higher and their payment or repayment programs is not quite as lenient as the subsidized loan through the federal government because the subsidized loan through the federal government you don't have to begin paying that loan back until A, you receive your cert certification or your degree, or when you leave school and you've left for at least six months. That's when your loans will begin to kick in for repayment with the federal loan, the subsidized. With the unsubsidized loan, these are loans that you set up through your local bank, um, your banking institutions, your credit unions, and payment or repayment begins, you know, almost immediately, like, you know, within 30 days. So it's not as lenient as um, the federal loan. So you don't want to use it unless you absolutely have to. But if you are going to go that route, go the subsidized route first. I want to back up to college work study because we didn't really touch on that. College work study is almost like a stipend, if you will, but it is a stipend in which you're actually working part-time hours, usually like 25 hours a week, you know, minimum wage, somewhere on campus, like the campus bookstore or the healthcare center or the recreational center. Through your federal grant, your Pell Grant, when you fill out the application, there is a question that asks you, are you interested in participating in college work study? If you check that box, then they will take out a portion of your Pell Grant award money and allot it for college work study, which means that you'll be allowed to go and work somewhere on campus, like I say, for part-time hours, and you will only be allowed to work up to that certain amount of money that they've allocated for that. It could be $500, it could be $1,000. It just is based upon A, how much they award you and the formula and calculations by which they use to figure all that information out. So um, it allows you to earn personal expense money because you know going to college is expensive. And if you want to be successful at it, you, you don't want to be concerned with having to get a part-time job somewhere because then that takes away from your study time and your grades could possibly suffer. So they have figured out a way to allow you to earn a small amount of personal money, you know, so that you're not completely broke on campus and still the schedule is flexible enough that it doesn't really interfere with your studies. So that's what college work study is about. You're given your Pell Grant Award money, they take out a small portion to allocate for the college work study program. You'll work a certain amount of hours per week up until you reach that threshold of the amount that they've allocated for that. Once you reach that threshold, then your campus employment will end and it will start again in the next season for your, your Pell Grant. Now, the other thing I want to uh, make a note on is one, this year's Pell Grant Award is $6,300. The Michigan Competitive Scholarship Award, it ranges between $2,300 and $3,000. In order to qualify for that Michigan Competitive Scholarship Grant, um, you would have had to receive Medicare at some point in your life between the ages of eight and 24 for a certain consecutive period, two years. And if you had, you know, if your parents had received 
Medicaid insurance for you as a child while you were in school and you become eligible for that TIP money. And you can add that to your Pell Grant money towards all of your college expenses. So you're kind of looking at if you receive maximum amounts, you're kind of looking at almost um, $10,000. So that's really good. And that's money that you shouldn't leave on the table if you are able to fill the application out and apply for the FAFSA, which is what we're going through now. So I'm going to show this quick little video on uh, the types of student aid that you can receive. If you need help paying for college or career school, the Office of Federal Student Aid might be your best option. We offer more than $150 billion to students each year in the form of grants, loans, and work-study funds. And federal student aid can be used to pay for school expenses, such as tuition, room and board, and books and supplies. After you've filled out the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA, you'll receive an award letter from each school you list on your FAFSA. This letter explains both the federal and non-federal financial aid options that a school is offering you. So let's talk about federal aid. If you qualify for and receive a federal grant, you won't have to repay the money. That will definitely help offset the cost of school, but you may still need additional help. If so, a federal student loan might be your answer. Remember, a student loan is just like any other loan. It's borrowed money that will have to be repaid with interest. If you plan to take out a loan, consider federal student loans first. Compared to private student loans, federal student loans often have lower fixed interest rates and offer many benefits that you won't find otherwise. For example, when it's time for you to repay your federal student loan, your loan servicer can work with you to find the best repayment plan for your individual needs. Plus, you may be able to adjust your loan payments based on your income. You also may be able to defer your federal loan payments, deduct student loan interest on your taxes, and even consolidate your eligible federal student loans into one loan with one monthly payment. Federal loans can even be forgiven based on certain types of employment. Getting a work-study job is another great option to help pay for school. Eligible undergraduate and graduate students will be able to earn at least minimum wage. If you have questions or need assistance, you can contact the financial aid office at your college or career school or visit studentaid.gov for more information. Okay, so one other thing I wanna say about the Pell Grant. Pell Grant, college work study, Michigan competitive, school specific scholarships, those, don't, those are grant monies that are free to you and don't have to be paid back. However, there are certain conditions that can occur that would require uh, the federal government to revoke that Pell Grant money from you. And those conditions are every semester that you enroll, you have to maintain a passing grade point average of at least 2.0. If you fall below that, they will revoke their, the grant monies from you. And they may require you to pay back any monies that they had already given you for it. So be mindful, it's not, you know, it's free money to you based upon um, the need that you are demonstrating financially. But your part of this particular bargain is that you will maintain passing grades every semester in order to keep it. The other thing that you want to consider is um, colleges and universities, uh, they are drug-free zones. And so I know that we in Michigan have legalized marijuana and we have even legalized recreational marijuana. However, that doesn't apply to you when you're in school. When you are in school and you are found to be in possession of or using, that puts your Pell Grant money in jeopardy and they can and will and have revoked those funds from students. So be mindful of that take that in consideration. Um, I know it's something that, you know, you don't really think of because you're like, how could this apply? But it really does. So just be mindful of that. If you need help paying for college or career school, the office. Okay. So next slide. So these are the documents that you are going to need to have 
in your possession and in front of you when you begin to fill out the uh, FAFSA application. It's not complicated. And truthfully, if you have all of your documents in place right in front of you, it could take you no less than about 30 minutes to, to um, well, maybe 45, because you have, to, you have to fill out the federal student aid ID first, and then you can fill out your uh, FAFSA application. But you're gonna need your social security card, you're gonna need your driver's license. You're going to, if you are an alien resident, you're gonna need your alien resident card. You're gonna need your tax return from 2019. If you have been uh, supporting yourself, your tax return. If your parents take care of you, then you're gonna need your parents' tax return. Um, you're gonna need their social security number as well along with their date of birth, the date of their marriage, and if they divorced, you're gonna need that information. All of this you need to have in front of you so that when you begin to fill out the information on the return, on the application, you can just plug these figures in and click next, 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 and it'll go real smooth. I'm going to stress that you need to have the actual documents in front of you, your actual social security card, not the number that you wrote down on a piece of paper that you had been using. Put the actual card in front of you. And the reason why I'm saying that specifically is because when you have the actual document, that's the number. You could have made a mistake and written something different when you wrote it on the piece of paper, or maybe you're maybe like me, your eyes are getting bad and you need a new prescription. And so you can't read your writing anymore. When you've got the actual document, you've got that number right there and it's accurate and you will plug it in and there'll be no mistakes. So these are the documents you're going to need. And here are what the documents look like. This is your W-2. This shows all of your earned income information, your parents' earned income information for the year. This is a copy of a 1040 return, tax return. This is the document you're going to need to supply the financial information for tax year 2019. If you are an alien resident here, is your alien registration card. You're gonna need that. And these are documents if you earn your income through uh, social security disability. This is the document you're gonna need for that. Then of course you have your social security card here and then your Michigan driver's license. If you don't drive and have a driver's license, it's okay, you don't have to put anything. They're not looking for you to substitute it with a state ID. If you have a driver's license, that's what they want. If you don't, don't worry about it. But these are what the documents that you're going to need to fill this application out. These are what they look like. Okay. So now we're going to go to how to create an FSA ID or your username and password. In order to do this, you're going to need a valid email address and a operating cell phone because you're going to need to verify your information through both through both of these um, means. It's real easy to do. It's six easy steps. Um, you're going to create the username and the password. You're going to enter your contact information. Um, you're going to create the challenge questions and then you're going to review and verify those simple questions and they're going to issue you your FSA ID and then you can begin to fill out your uh, FAFSA application. So I'm gonna take a quick look at this video on how to do that. Perhaps you're a student, parent, or loan borrower who needs supply for financial aid electronically sign your FAFSA form, 
or access other functionalities on the studentaid.gov site. To take full advantage of all our resources and log into studentaid.gov, you'll have to first create an FSA ID. Your FSA ID gives you access to Federal Student Aid's features, tools, and can serve as your legal signature. Your FSA ID is your account username and password. To prepare to create your FSA ID, have your social security number, mobile phone, and your personal email address handy. To start, navigate to studentaid.gov and select Create Account. Once you're on the Create Account page, select the Get Started button. If you are completing a FAFSA form and are considered a dependent student, keep in mind that you will need to create your own separate FSA ID using your own personal information. A mobile phone number, email address, and social security number can be associated with only one FSA ID. For helpful tips throughout the FSA ID creation process, select the question mark icons that display next to each field. Next, you'll create your username, enter an email address, and create your password. We recommend using a non-school-based email address since you will need to access your federal student aid account after you graduate. Make sure you don't include private information such as your name or date of birth as part of your password. Quick tip, remember, an email address can be associated with only one username and password. Next, enter your permanent address and mobile phone number. Indicate if you want to use your mobile phone for account recovery. We highly recommend this option as it will help you access your account if you forget your username or password in the future. After selecting Continue, you'll be prompted to choose your Communications Preferences. On the Communications Preferences screen, select if you'd like to receive required communications from the Department of Education via email or by postal mail. We recommend email. Besides the required communications, we'll occasionally send you informational communications about grants, student loan forgiveness, or income-based repayment plans you may qualify for. You can opt to receive these by email, text message, or both, or choose not to receive informational communications. You'll also have the option to select English or Spanish as your preferred language for the communications we send you. Next, you'll select four challenge questions and answers. Memorize or keep these answers in a safe place in case you need them to help access your account in the future. Choose a question using the drop-down and add your answer in the text box. Select Show Answer to see your answer as you type it. Your answers are not case sensitive. You're almost there. On this step, you can review your information and confirm everything looks correct. If you need to make a correction, select the Edit button within that tile of information. After ensuring your information is correct, review and agree to the terms and conditions at the bottom of the screen. This is the last step before your account is completed. Select the Verify My Mobile Phone Number button and or the Verify My Email Address button to verify your contact information. If you entered an email address and mobile phone number for your account, you'll need to verify both. After selecting the Verify My Mobile Phone Number button, you will see a pop-up. Enter the six-digit secure code that was sent to the mobile number associated with your account. If you did not receive a code, select the Resend Secure Code link. After entering the six-digit code and selecting Continue, you will see a Verify checkmark under the Verify My Mobile Phone Number button. The same steps apply when verifying your email address. Select the Verify My Email Address button and enter the six-digit code you received in your email in the pop-up box. Note, the secure code will expire after 30 minutes. Once your contact information is verified, select Finish. Congratulations, you've successfully created your FSA ID. If you entered an email address, you will receive a confirmation email. Make sure you note your username and password and keep them in a safe place. You can begin using your account immediately, but it will take one to three days for your information to be verified by the Social Security Administration. Some of your actions in the site will be limited until your information is verified. However, with your newly created FSA ID, you can immediately complete and sign a first-time FAFSA form. You can also use your FSA ID to access your dashboard, review your loan balance, and explore additional dashboard features. 
you are now able to take control of your federal student aid journey and access all studentaid.gov has to offer. Okay, so again, filling out your FAFSA begins by creating your username and password. This username and password is going to follow you throughout your entire educational career. The federal government doesn't want you creating a new one every year. The one you create now is the one that's going to continue with you until you no longer are pursuing funding from the federal government for your education. So I suggest you make a hard copy, write it down and put it in your files. But I also suggest you take a picture of it with your cell phone and keep it along with your security questions in the notes section or in the memo section of your cell phone so that you can always have this handy because this is how you access the information on whether or not you're eligible, how much you're eligible for, your award amounts. This is where you're gonna be receiving all this information. So it's best that you keep it uh, secure and to keep it handy. Okay, so now we're going to fill out the FAFSA application. Again, it's free, it's online, and if you have all of those documents that I showed you in a few slides ago, if you have all of that information in front of you, it really should not take you longer than 30 minutes because it's really simple. And there is a box down at the bottom of the page when you get to the financial section that will say, transfer your income from the IRS. If your parents or if you filled out your tax return for 2019 and filed it with the government already, they have that information on file. If you just click that button, they will transfer all that information onto your FAFSA application and that will eliminate at least 10 of those 30 minutes in filling out your application. So look for that button. If you filled it out, click it, let them transfer over the information and it will make that process that much more simple for you. It's the actual application is broken into three sections. Your personal contact information, your financial information, and then information about your parents. Like I say, if you're independent and you take care of yourself, you can just skip that last section. So it, it, it really is a simple process. I'm gonna click this video so that we can uh, go in and see the steps for it. The Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, is the application for grants, loans, and work-study funds provided by the federal government. It is also used by many states and schools for their financial aid programs. For the fastest and easiest way to apply, visit our official website, fafsa.gov. The FAFSA is available in English and Spanish. As you fill it out online, you'll be able to automatically skip questions that don't pertain to you, check out your status immediately, and get online help. It takes most people less than 30 minutes to complete the application. You'll need a few things when you fill it out, so get ready by gathering your social security number, your permanent resident card if you have one, any W-2 forms or records of money you earned for the previous year, and your tax records. By the way, a nice time-saving feature of the FAFSA is that many people are eligible to automatically transfer their tax data from the IRS into the FAFSA. So keep an eye out while you're applying in case you're offered that option. If you have any questions about what information to gather, there is a complete list of documents that you will need at FAFSA.gov. Before you begin the process of filling out the FAFSA, you should create a username and password called an FSA ID that will act as your electronic signature. You'll only need to create an FSA ID once, and you can use it to renew your FAFSA each year that you apply. Your parents will need an FSA ID too if they have to provide any information. So now you're ready to begin filling out the FAFSA to apply for financial aid. There are three groups of questions that include personal information, 
such as your name, address, and marital status, financial information, such as your income, and any parent information that is required. If you get hung up or confused about a question, the Help and Hints box on the right-hand side of the application can help with each question as you move along. Also, look for the online chat feature under Help if you would like assistance from a knowledgeable agent. Because colleges and career schools use the FAFSA to provide financial aid, you can list up to 10 schools that you are interested in attending. You should list all of the schools that you are considering, even if you haven't been accepted or applied yet. If you have more than 10 schools in mind, you can submit your FAFSA with 10 schools and then replace some of those schools with other schools later. When you finish filling out the FAFSA, use your FSA ID to sign the form. If you are required to submit parent information on your FAFSA, a parent will need to sign the application with his or her own FSA ID as well. If you have any questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. So, as you can see, it really is a simple process. All you do is just plug in the information from the documents that you have in front of you. And as, as I say, if you file the, uh, the tax return for the previous year, if you hit the transfer information button at the bottom of, of the application, it will automatically plug that information into those areas that are asking those questions from uh, the 2019 return. And then you can proceed to the next section and just move on. It's real simple, it's real easy. Having the documents in front of you eliminates you making um, any typos and mistakes so that they don't have to hold up the process and contact you and say, hey, we need verification of this information, that information. That's why it's important for you to have it. Also, I wanna um, make a comment on communication. When you're filling out your FSA ID, it's gonna ask you, do you want them to communicate with you information by either email or text message. Um, whichever one you prefer is up to you. However, check one of them most certainly because there are so many scholarships and grants that are out there and available to you. And what they're saying is that they'll send that information to you directly in your email or in your phone so that you can go through and take advantage of any scholarships um, or grants that are being offered that you can use and uh, qualify for. Okay. The free application for federal student. So you've got your FSA ID, username and password, and you filled out your FAFSA application. Now, what do you do? Now you wait for them to send you confirmation that they received your transmission, which they will send you immediately. Once you hit submit, they will automatically send you a, trans a confirmation email saying that they've received the transmission. Next, you're going to look for them to send you your student aid report, which will show you your award monies how they're going to award you, whether or not you're gonna receive the Pell Grant, uh, whether or not you're gonna receive work study, or whether or not you qualify for a student loans. Now, again, I have to emphasize, you're gonna qualify for student loans, but those are the things that you don't wanna utilize unless you absolutely have to. Now, if you start out in community college, you're not gonna need a student loan for that because the tuition amount per semester for um, a full load, 12 to 15 credit hours, your Pell Grant award money will cover all of that expense. So you won't need a student loan for that. You would only need a student loan if you're going like from high school straight into university where a year's tuition and room and board is running like $25,000, dollars $40,000 a year. That's when the student loan comes into play. But again, if you're going to do school debt-free as possible, 
do your first two years in community college where your liberal arts classes don't cost as much. Why pay top dollar for an English one class at a university when you can take it at a community college for a fraction of the cost. So you want to do it as debt free as possible. After you after you filled out your FAFSA application, you're going to look for the transmission confirming that they received it. And then you're going to be on the lookout for your student aid or SARS report. Once you receive your SARS report telling you how much you're eligible for and which kinds of financial aid you're going to be receiving, if you have any questions, contact the financial aid department of the school that you applied to. Back when you filled out um, your FSA ID, they asked you what schools you're interested in attending and they allow you up to 10 that you can list. I know they allow you 10, but don't put 10. You shouldn't be that broad in where it is you wanna go. You can narrow down your selection to about three to five schools because you should be basing this on one, tuition costs, how much it costs, two, the kind of program that you're gonna be going into, whether the school has the program that you're interested in, and three, um, how close in proximity is it to your home? You know, how far do you have to travel? These are the things that you should be considering when you're applying to these colleges and universities. Now, currently, because we're in the pandemic, all applications, all application fees have been waived for um, most universities. Community colleges don't charge an application fee, but universities do. Now, when we come out of the pandemic and, and they go back to normal, charging the application fee, even though the, the FAFSA application allows you to um, list 10 different schools, you have to remember, if you're applying to 10 different schools, that's 10 different application fees. And application fees can range anywhere from $50 to $100. So you want, you, you want to take that in consideration, and that's why I say, don't apply for 10 schools. Narrow your choices down to like between three and five. And again, your criteria should be, you know, how much it costs, how close is it to your home, and what type of program do they offer that you're interested in pursuing. So we're going to take a look at this last quick video about what to do once you have filled out the application. So, you filled out the FAFSA. Now what? The information you submitted will be processed by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid, and the colleges or career schools you listed will be notified so they can begin their process of awarding aid. The great thing about filling out the FAFSA online is that you can check its processing status immediately. This comes in handy when you're thinking, I wonder if it went through. Within a few days of filling out the FAFSA, you'll get your Student Aid Report, or SAR. You'll hear that abbreviation again, so just remember, your SAR is your Student Aid Report. Basically, it summarizes all of the information you submitted on the FAFSA. You can access your SAR online at fafsa.gov using your FSA ID, which is your username and password. Check your SAR for any mistakes. Then make corrections if you need to but only if you estimated your tax information or provided incorrect information the day you filled out the FAFSA. On your SAR, you'll see reference to your EFC, or Expected Family Contribution. This number is used to determine your eligibility for federal student aid. It doesn't mean you actually have to contribute that amount. The financial aid office at each college or career school you list on your FAFSA will receive your information. Each office will then use your FAFSA information to determine how much aid you can get at that school. It's possible that your college or career school may require you to verify the information you submitted on your FAFSA. If that happens, your school will tell you what you need to do. Once you're accepted into a college or career school, you'll get an award letter from a school's financial aid office that explains the aid being offered to you. We'd recommend comparing award letters from multiple schools. 
That way you can make the best decision for your situation. If you have any questions about your financial aid offer, contact the school's financial aid office. If your aid offer includes a federal loan and you're a first-time borrower, there are a few more steps before you get your loan. You'll need to complete entrance counseling and sign the Master Promissory Note, or MPN, which is your agreement to pay back the loan. Your school will provide you with the necessary information. So how do you get your money? Well, usually your grants and loans will be applied to tuition, fees, and other charges on your student account first. Then any leftover money is paid to you. Work-study funds are earned throughout the term. Remember, filling out the FAFSA is not a one-time thing. You must complete it every year you attend school. If you have questions or need more information, please visit studentaid.gov. Okay, so once you fill out the FAFSA application, you're going to receive confirmation that they've received the transmission, and then they're going to send you either a verification notification, which is going to say, hey, we need to verify some areas on your application that um, don't quite match up with what we have. And so we need you to submit additional information so that we can confirm this information. Simple, easy process to do. If you receive any notifications like that, address it quickly. Because again, these are prolonging the award letter saying, hey, you've been awarded X amount of money for your Pell Grant. So as soon as you receive it, address it right away. Again, if when you receive your student aid report or your SARS, if you don't understand it, there are resources for you to go to that will help you understand the report. Your first resource is the financial aid office for where you've applied to go to school. You can contact them and they'll help you go through it, help you understand it, explain it. They will also explain any additional verifications that they may need and that you'll need to supply to them so that you can get your final award. Or there are other organizations that will assist you and go through your uh, FAFSA application as well as your SARS report so that you can um, get a full and complete understanding and get your award and your grant amount. So you filled out the FAFSA. That brings me to this next slide. Wayne State University has an organization called TRIO Education. TRIO Education is um, a very good nonprofit organization that helps students with their FAFSA application. Not only can you contact them and say, hey, I got um, some questions I need to ask because I'm not understanding this accurately or completely, they literally will help you go through step-by-step step the application, the actual application, and they'll tell you, okay, put this amount in this box, answer this question this way. They'll go through it step-by-step. Step. Ms. Rogers is the representative for TRIO Education. Um, she's been working with um, our organization for several years now, and she's helped many students uh, fill out their FAFSA application, get their FA, FSA ID, um, explain their SARS report, their award amount. She's been a very good resource in that area. Not only um, does she, you know, does TRIO provide that type of service, but they also provide um, application fee waivers. Um, I mentioned a while ago that because we're in the pandemic, universities have suspended any application fee with regards to applying to their university. When we go back to being normal and they begin to charge again their application fee, Ms. Rogers is someone that you can contact and say, hey, um, you know, I can't really pay this application fee. And she'll give you a fee waiver for that particular school or university to waive that application fee. She, uh, their organization also provides assistance to young men 
in applying to selective services. Um, again, Wayne Trio is located on Wayne State's campus. Now, while they are housed on Wayne State's campus, they are not limited to just Wayne State students. They will help you apply to any school in or out of uh, the state of Michigan, wherever you wanna go. TRIO Education will assist you in applying to different programs, different colleges, different universities. And they do all of this for free. There is absolutely no charge to students that need assistance in this way. So Ms. Rogers is her name. TRIO Education is the name of the organization. Her contact number is here and you can reach her by phone or by email. And because we're in the pandemic, she will set up a Zoom appointment with you and go over your information and help you out. It's private. You don't have to worry about other people, you know, being in on the call and listening. She'll talk one-on-one -on -one with you for as long as you, you know, as long as you desire until you get your understanding. Again, these are a list of the services they provide. They help you get your FSA ID. They help you fill out the FAFSA application. They answer questions regarding the FAFSA application, help you through whatever difficulty. They help, help to explain your a student aid report. Um, they help you through the verification process. It's like I say, sometimes you'll You'll plug in some information that um, the federal government is not quite sure of and want you to further confirm. And so they'll send you a report back saying, hey, please verify this information for us. Ms. Rogers and TRIO Education will explain that process and help you do that as well. Like I say, um, she will also assist you, young men, to register with selective services. You may wonder, why am I bringing this up? Well, because young men, you have to register for selective services in order to be eligible for the Pell Grant. You will not receive a Pell Grant award if you do not register for selective services. So that's why that is on there. Also, there are young people that find themselves in a homeless situation. Um, some literally on the street, and then some, you know, moving from place to place, you know, friends couch, you know, couch surfing, you know, this friend this week, you know, a relative next month. They don't have a stable home base that they can be um, reached at on, you know, continually. There is a process that if you can't document where you're living and how you're earning your income, that will disqualify you from receiving financial aid. Ms. Rogers and the TRIO Education um, staff, they will work with you to help get that documentation for you so that you can receive financial aid and go to school and uh, pursue your education and reach all of your goals. So these are the services that they offer. Excellent organization. If you have any questions, difficulties, give them a call. This is another resource for you. In addition to your school's financial aid office, you can contact TRIO Education. Now, upcoming events. Henry Ford Community College is holding two virtual financial aid information sessions. One on March 10th from three to four, and another one on March 25th from uh, six to seven. And in this session, they will provide you with information on um, how to minimize your student debt. Uh, they will give you tips on how to fill out your FAFSA application. Uh, they will help you check your financial aid status. And they will give you information on um, the scholarships that Henry Ford is offering to their students for students that enroll in Henry Ford Community College. So March 10th from three to four, 
and March 25th from six to seven. Go online, register and check it out. You can go to www.hfccc.edu and um, get the information, another resource that will help you if you need help through some difficulty or in understanding anything. So that is my presentation for today. Are there any questions? I know we covered an awful lot. <laughs> Hey, Miss Tony, you have a couple of questions in the chat box. Okie dokie. So let me come out of share so that I can see what they are. And open up the chat. Okay, I don't have a driver's license. Okay, if you don't have a driver's license, again, it's okay. They only want the information if you have it. If you don't have it, don't worry about supplying it. What they want, social security card and tax information. If you are independent, meaning you're taking care of yourself, then they want your tax information. If you are living with parents and your parents are taking care of you, then they want their tax information. If you are just a high school student, um, living at home with your parents, the only thing you will have to supply is your social security card and or if you're an alien resident, your alien card. So how often can a student apply for a TIP? Okay, just like the FAFSA, it is a yearly thing. Once a year you apply, once a year they determine if you're eligible to receive it. And Oh, quite a few questions. Let's go. Okay, let's go back, go back. Uh, okay, so the Pell Grant award amount, the maximum amount is 6,300. And for the um, Michigan competitive, it ranges between 2,300 and 3,000. So if you are, I'm gonna say it this way, Almost all of our My Virtual and Step Up students qualify for the maximum amount. So then if you get your application in early, then you will be eligible to receive the maximum amount of the award. It's a first come first serve basis. So the longer you wait, the more you run the chance of not receiving all that you could receive. But Next year, when it's time to open up, FAFSA application starts October 1st, and runs through March 1st, like it did this year. So next fall, when it starts up, right when it opens, get that information and fill it out. That way you know that you're ahead of the line and you'll get the maximum amount of your award. Uh, Well, they kind of, question is, does TIP expire and does it have an expiration date? They kind of run, coincide with the FAFSA application. So the deadline is relatively around the same time because it is, as I say, everybody is pulling from that FAFSA application to get their information to determine your eligibility for the award. Uh, do, 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 do. And that's all we have. Again, your FAFSA, your TIP, as well as any other scholarship and grant. Once a year, you apply one time a year, they, they determine your eligibility for the year. It's not even a per semester thing because it's kind of given and automatic that if you go fall, you're gonna go the winter semesters as well. It's just like in high school, you, are, you start in September and you're not, you're not complete until you go to June. So it's, it's just like in high school, you're expected to attend both semesters. So the award 
for the grant, any grant, any scholarship is for one full year. And then that next school year, you apply again. Any more questions? I know it's a lot of information um, and I tried to break it up in smaller chunks. It's, it's so not complicated. Again, like I say, if you have all of your information in front of you, right then as you're filling the application out, you don't have to worry about A, making mistakes because you're looking right at your documents. And two, it won't take as long because you don't have to search for anything. It's all right there. And you just go from one section to the next and it'll go by real quick. I've, I've, I've gone through the documents myself. It's, it really is super easy. It really is. It only gets complicated if you don't have the information that they're asking for. So if there are any more questions and I wanna thank everyone for joining me today. Um, I know this information is going to be helpful to your students and students, I know it's going to be helpful to you and your family. And you can review this and look this over and, and just use it as a tutorial to help you go through the step-by-step -step process. Um, thank you for joining me, everyone, on College and Career Pathways. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My phone number is 586-842-0558. My extension is 312. And my email is tonic at atsedu.net. If you need any resources, any help, um, please reach out to me. I'll help you. I'll direct you, whatever it is you need. And with that being said, everybody have a great day. <laughs>